This is going to limit your style. Yeah. So, good morning, ShmooCon 2018. So, a few announcements. Uh, first off, in registration, we have t-shirts and past year's conference bags and bags of crap for sale. Note, I say for sale, that's a misnomer. They are all, we take the income from that and they go directly to charity. That is not a, we take the profit and don't that to charity. All of the money that you guys give us for t-shirts goes directly to donations to some pretty good charities. So please go buy a t-shirt. If you like our past year's conference bags, you're welcome to buy one of those, uh, as well as bags of crap. That is uh, at least one t-shirt of a size that's marked in the bag, as well as some uh, interesting stuff that we've had in the years past, uh, water bottles or stuff like that. Um, so again, all of that is directly to charity. It, uh, we take none of the income from that. It goes directly to charity. Um, so before we start this one, the first talk for today, uh, I have some stuff to throw out into the audience. Instead of doing like I normally do, which is throw them at people, and uh, offer these up for trivia questions. So uh, since ShmooCon 2018 is all about space, First person to raise your hand and answer this, I uh, will give them a nice plush space shuttle. What was the last manned mission to the moon? No. <laughs> that, that was the last manned movie. <laughs> Yay, you can have a space shuttle. All right. <laughs> Thank you, John Mack. All right, and because this talk is a lot about reverse engineering, more on the hardware side, but if you're in here, you're probably interested in other types of reverse engineering. So who could tell me what the leave instruction does in x86? Leave. <laughs> you, with the, what? No. It's close enough. You can have some moose antlers. All right. <laughs> so you all should be familiar with Kate and Dominic from wonderful uh, projects like Face Dancer and Ubertooth. So before uh, we get too much ahead of uh, uh, off schedule, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to Kate and Dominic who will be talking about uh, Glitch Kit. I kind of like how I, as soon as you, I'm, I'm probably going to be pretty close to this. I was going to say. I like how uh, as soon as you hear the word Ubertooth, you kind of go like, yeah, I guess that's something I did. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, good days. Uh, so we have a, a interesting speaking style, which is at least one of us paces a lot, and we have really short microphone cords. So if at any point we wander away from a microphone, you can't hear us, can someone shout at us and tell us off? You take that one, I'll take this one. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's yeah, it's not me who has the pacing problem. Um, all right, I'm Dominic, this is Kate. Here are some pictures of us, some projects we previously did, um, but rather than dwelling on the past, uh, let's move on to people we're gonna thank. Um, we like to throw this slide up at, up at the front so you know that we didn't come up with everything ourselves. This is entirely built on kind of the foundation of other people's work. So do you want to? Yeah, do you want me to go off from the first couple? Of yeah, you do. Let's go on them. So uh, we build tools. We're not uh, the kind of people who usually come up with groundbreaking new techniques. I usually start this by saying I'm not a hacker. Um, the stuff that I've done to the Switch in the past week may kind of make that statement seem a little bit uh, underwhelming. But uh, we have the. Uh, we're really building on the foundation that a lot of people put out for us. So I'd like to spend the time thanking uh, Mike Elizabeth Scott or Scanline. We'll see some of her work. Colin O'Flynn, whose work we'll see here. Uh, Travis Goodspeed, who found, uh, kind of founded the Face Dancer project that eventually uh, kind of inspired some of the USB work. Mike Ospin, who gives us money. Yeah. Yeah, Mike Ospin, who gives us money and hardware. Um, Yeti, who <laughs> insists on having his name blanked out. Uh, he's Taylor. He, he's um, 
works in the Great Gadgets lab and he assembles hardware for us, um, sometimes at incredibly short notice. And do you want to thank Hedgeberg? Yeah, so. and, uh, my friend Hedgeberg, who does uh, Twitch streams on reverse engineering and hacking video games, is actually one of the first people to use GlitchKit, so uh, oh, yeah. for uh, her suffering. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Great Scott Gadgets because that's how we can afford to be here. So. All right, so start with the story, kind of give some context as to why we want to start opening these closed systems. This device here is the, actually the internals of an HDMI switch. It doesn't really matter which HDMI switch, because if you take any of them apart, they all look like this. And this HDMI switch had kind of an irritating problem in that while I'm using it, occasionally the screen would flicker on and off, just as I'm sitting there trying to play a video game or watch something with the spouse. And so I did the natural thing that anyone does when they start having a problem with a piece of consumer electronics and ripped the casing off, started looking inside, and figured out that the issue was actually the hot plug detect signal. It was detecting that signals were turning on and it was getting HDMI inputs when there actually were no new inputs around. And it would be really easy to fix this kind of thing if we have the firmware for it. So if we actually were capable of taking the device, taking the microcontroller that drives it and reprogramming it, it would be really a two second fix. They really needed to debounce the signal that they were using to detect new inputs. But yeah, this microphone's not super amplified. The, but one of the issues here is that the firmware for this is completely closed source, right? They never shipped it with this. They had no reason to make it open source. If we can get our hands on the firmware, it would be a two second modification, but there's no canonical way to do that. And, and we should, oh, I'm sure. gonna take this from you. And, and we should say that the, the solution you came up with in that circumstances was just to like drop a hundred bucks on or fifty bucks on a new on a new HDMI switch because you couldn't get it out, right? Yeah, for that one, it wasn't really worth spending the time and effort to reverse engineer this. Kind right, of thing. There, there comes a point at which reverse engineering a, a fifty dollars piece of hardware is like not worth your time and energy. Uh, but it also led to you deciding it, you'd like it to be easier to reverse engineer mm -hmm. these pieces of hardware. Sorry. So it's fine. We can, I mean, just you can talk this. You do that <laughs> one. I'll do this one. Okay. So the next piece of hardware here is actually the SecureFet one. And this is a horrible hack modification of the uh, Great Fet one with a different microcontroller swapped out. This microcontroller is a secure microcontroller, which naturally means it's unhackable. So we'll definitely not be telling you how we hacked it later. The key here is this, the microcontroller on this board is completely ROMless. It has firmware that's stored somewhere else. To keep that firmware a secret, they AES encrypt the firmware and then decrypt it using a key that is burned into the microcontroller as the microcontroller starts up. And that kind of thing can be limiting. It's difficult to break an AES key, right, unless you have all the time in the world, all the time in the universe, time is millions. But if you can get that AES key out or get the microcontroller to disclose its firmware in another way, you can actually start making modifications to things that are based off this microcontroller without necessarily having to reverse engineer all the functionality and then recreate the firmware from scratch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, so largely, like, let's take a quick bit of background. Has anyone ever um, used fault injection or, or glitching as an uh, as an attack method against embedded hardware? Show of hands. Anyone ever used the chip whisperer or anything that looks like uh, it? <laughs> it looks like the thing that I just dropped on the floor. Um, I'm sure we have a picture of it later in the slides. <laughs> Uh, but it's a little board by uh, Colin O'Flynn. It's a great piece of hardware. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of background on what glitching is and how that works. And um, did alcohol just turn up on the stage, Will? Uh, thanks, buddy. Um, so essentially, like, um, we make a, a whole load of assumptions that things are just gonna work when we write code. And um, so you can see these two examples here. Uh, one is um, a paper about kind of elf parsers and how you assume that give you, if you write a spec, two people are going to write parsers that work in the same way and exploiting the fact that multiple people might write um, different parsers and therefore you can produce a file that is compliant to a, a standard and different parsers parse it in different ways. Uh, you see this all the time with uh, POC or GTFO and PDF, um, PDF software uh, viewers and things. Um, the other one is Stracopy, and obviously that assumes that you have the uh, properly null terminated piece of memory and you have like the space to put it in and all that sort of thing. And, and we know from history that this is like a pretty bad assumption to make. Um, this also applies to hardware. 
any any microcontroller, any chip on a on a board is it's got a voltage supply. Um, you have to power the thing, and it assumes that you're you've read the data sheet and you have you've read the data sheet and that you are um, uh, giving it the right amount of power um, that you are within spec. That you're giving it the clock signal it wants. Like if you tell it it's going to have a 25 megahertz clock, it assumes that you're giving it roughly a 25 megahertz clock or something along those lines. Um, and so, so glitching or fault injection is is kind of subverting those assumptions in the same way that you might do so in software for uh, other types of assumptions. So, do you want to add anything at this point? I you did this like, one on the next. Yeah. One. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Um, so, uh, one of those kind of simpler of the of the two main forms of glitching, vol um, uh, voltage glitching, clock glitching. I personally find clock glitching to be a little bit easier to understand, which is why I'm going to explain it up front. Um, we're not going to do any to clock glitching today. Um, it tends to have some drawbacks. Um, but specifically what, you, what happens inside your processor is on each clock pulse, a series of things happen, and they don't all happen at once. They happen in various stages. So the first thing is we maybe um, increment the program counter, then we decode the instruction that was at the program counter, then we kind of go and actually do the computation that's associated with that. And all that happens within that clock pulse, within um, a, that series of time. But if what we do is we shorten that clock pulse, then in many cases, only the first uh, parts of that will, will happen. So the program counter might get incremented, but the instructions that get decoded from that do not get executed. So what happens is we skip over instructions when we um, give a shorter uh, clock pulse. There is a side effect to this, which is the way most uh, chips run um, their clocks these days, is uh, they have a phase lock loop. And this thing suddenly says, wow, I'm not at the frequency I thought I was at. I should correct that. And you get ringing. And what happens is that the, you get a lot of uh, variation in the clock afterwards until it stabilizes again. And this means you might skip the instruction you think you're skipping, but also it has after effects, like knock-on effects afterwards. It has knock-on effects afterwards that uh, cause um, other instructions maybe to get skipped. And so it can be unreliable in that sense. Uh, and do you want to talk about voltage glitching? Yeah, sure. And I'll let you do this one. Just kind of one thing to add to that is oh, yeah. that when you look at that on a, on a piece of hardware, all these things are happening in parallel, right? So you might have a program counter increment happening at the same time as an instruction is executed. All of those individual parallel paths are kind of racing to be the one that provides the next value to a given register. So if you can shorten that clock pulse, you actually get to choose the winner of the race yourself. So whoever gets there first, even if it's not the uh, signal that it's correct, winds up being the signal that sets the next value. So we can do things like skip branch instructions, which is super useful for making it so that we don't break out of loops or do break out of loops. The next form of uh, glitching that's a lot more practical on a lot of common devices is voltage glitching. And this winds up being used kind of as a method of last resort, as a technique of last resort, because if we can clock glitch, that's much more readily understood. It's much more reliable. A voltage glitch is kind of the thing you do when something like a phase lock loop inside a processor is preventing you from clock glitching. So if we look at uh, some example CMOS circuits that are not super important, the, the takeaway from this is that when you start using digital circuits, electrons flow mostly when things are changing. And so electrons are required in order to enact change. And if you suddenly start taking the power supply of that chip, pulling it to something other than what it should be, if you start taking the power supply and yanking it down to zero all of a sudden for just a split second, you're taking away all the electrons that are needed to make those changes happen, and you're very likely to corrupt the values of things that are changing. So we have a little bit of control that we can potentially use to start making microcontroller systems misbehave, and often larger application processors, and we'll talk about some of the things that we have uh, actually glitched once we get through the background. You want to take this again? Or yeah, um, I can. I know this slide. Slide and I are very good friends. Um, I just got to read it first. Give me a second. Um, so, right, so let's, uh, let's say you're, uh, you're pushing out data from, I don't know, some, in some kind of pipe, like a UART or something like that. And a naive way of writing that might be that you work out the length that you need to, to um, uh, send, and then you it's like decrement that, pushing out the next, the next byte of data each time. Like, and, and this is a pretty reasonable thing that someone might have written, and then we've kind of hand translated it into some, some kind of pseudo assembly. To a variant of assembly that doesn't exist that happened to be easy to write in a plane when we were flying in the Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like this, but I'm, 
I'm hopeful that most people can roughly understand the right-hand side. Um, I'm kind of happy to go through it, but like it's it's pretty well commented. Um, the idea is we're constantly checking a whether uh, what the value of we're decrementing the length. We're seeing if it's zero, sending a byte if it's not, and and then looping. It's exactly what you see on the left-hand side. Um, and if we were going to glitch this and we want to jump over certain instructions, there are actually a few that might be of interest to us. Uh, so one is that multiply. Um, that multiply to get the size of the, the items that we're going to transmit, if we can glitch that in such a way to make the result of that be a huge number, we're going to send more than our, our string of bytes. Um, so that'd be nice, but we only get one chance at that. that. That instruction is only executed once, and um, so like we get one chance at that. Uh, that decrement, if at the point when it hits um, zero, or sorry, if at any point during that, that decrement, we can glitch it to make it have an arbitrarily large value. So we, we give it a voltage spike, and it, the result of that computation is not subtracting one, but is just changing the, the result value to be an arbitrarily large number, then we're going to get significantly more bytes sent uh, than we anticipate. And, and lastly, that jump. If we can glitch the jump at the point that it reaches zero, uh, then and we can skip that, then it will keep decrementing, and that value will loop back. And again, we'll get whatever whatever it is, like an int or a whatever. Uh, we'll get the maximum value of that because it will go to negative one and keep decrementing. Um, so, if you look at the bottom left in in terms of time, it's, it might be hard to see on the projector um, because of the light, but. We have lots of lots of different points at which we can try and try and insert a fault into this um, into this flow, and at, if we, it's kind of a timing problem. If we can get it to the right state at the right time, and then and then we just iteratively vary that timing until we hit it once. The the point of glitching is to do something to do this thing once, have it work, let us dump the firmware, and then we can go and look at other look at that firmware and do other things with that data that we've got. We don't. So there's kind of an assumption here that you have a view of the firmware in order to be able to even reason about those timings. Most of the time you don't. So glitching in a lot of cases is not a process where you're going to sit and reason and think, I want to inject a fault at exactly this point. It's more of the kind of process where you try over right. and over and over again and hope that the glitch that you put falls on one of those lines. So, so the process of, of this is like, this is a thing you're going to do at one time to try and like, for example, get the firmware out. This is not a thing that I'm going to create a tool and then everyone's going to go and glitch their identical piece of hardware exactly the same way because like, the, the goal is that I do it once and then I give everyone the firmware and you go and do nefarious things with this piece of this IoT piece of crap that you're trying to glitch. Um, and so, so that, yeah, it's, a, it's an iterative process. So what we need to do is we get the system into a state where we think a glitch is going to do something, and then we delay for a very short amount of time, try and glitch. Did that work? No. Okay, reset the system, uh, get it into that state again, delay a little bit longer, try the glitch. And so it's, it's a relatively slow iterative process, but at some point you get this, this sort of value, set of values that work and give you some interesting different data from what you'd expect the output to be, and you can go and analyze those. Um, now... Some people might look at that code and say, well, I'd write better code than that. I'd, I'd, write, um, I'd write it more, you know, extra checks, and I'd write it in a more clever way or something like that, um, which is exactly the kind of hubris I'd come up with. Um, but it turns out inside your microcontroller, there are a bunch of peripherals. And imagine that the peripherals are implemented in exactly the way a lot of code is. There's a time budget. There's a, like, transistors cost money. Like you've only got a certain amount of area on the on the chip die, and so people implement things in the simplest possible way. Um, so, for example, in most microcontrollers, you've got a DMA controller, and that would just dump memory from one place to another. And it turns out that thing does not have error checking in most microcontrollers, especially the one uh, that we're using. Um, and so, there's no, there's, it's not going to do bounds checking. It's not going to complain that it's accessing memory that you shouldn't be accessing. If you can convince the DMA controller by in, in some way to accept arbitrary input values, you can read whatever piece of memory you want. And this is incredibly common on a lot of embedded systems. Um, do you want to show? Yeah, go ahead. You want to swipe over? Which way? Um, I don't know. Just swipe. I am. Um, not the other. I'll just escape at a PowerPoint first. OK. Any minute now. I apologize. I don't know how to use a Mac. Um, 
Right. That's so, and it's worth that's mentioning only. that those kind of DMA behaviors are not just on microcontrollers. They exist on things like x86 PCs and ARM application processors as well. And we use this uh, quite readily on things like the Nintendo Switch when we're doing these kind of attacks. I can't use your keyboard. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, to, sorry. You want me to type? Yeah, I do want you to type. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. We yes. Apparently we can. So what we did here, like, and this is this is not uh, an attack against the Great Fet. We we just have a Great Fet plugged in. We wrote a um, what Kate wrote a a function on the Great Fet so that we can just send it arbitrary DMA requests. Um, so like this is incredibly. This worked at CCC. This uh, this worked when we practiced it this morning. This isn't this isn't even the clever demo. Or no, not this, this one. Just like the demo, demo. Yeah. Anyway, this is just showing you that they, essentially what we're trying to show you here is that what you can do is pass arbitrary values to a, a DMA controller. And if that memory doesn't exist, it will just return zeros. And if you pass um, values of like memory mapped I.O., it will just dump those registers to, to you. And then you can send that back a, a, to the host. What's going on? Oh, really? Using the version of GreatFed on my system instead of the version that actually yep. has the things we need. Excellent. I'm running out of things to say while you type. Wow. Yes, excellent. All right. You can tell we are definitely professionals. Yep, we're running the right version of code now. Oh, I hope the right version of firmware is running on the <laughs> great fat. Um, so uh, what we're doing is... <laughs> no. <laughs> Fix it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, let's pretend that works. Um, so... <laughs> Um, essentially, what that was uh, supposed to show is that we can pass like any value we like to the the DMA controller. <laughs> Should we go back to the slides and yeah. and write this off as having not worked? Oh, um, the other one's before me in the path. So. Yeah, but it's not worth seeing. It's not that exciting. Yeah, essentially, what you get is you get um, you can have things just dumped out to you from the DMA controller because the DMA controller does not care that something is protected memory or special or is memory mapped I/O or doesn't exist. It would just give us whatever we want. You have a different thing on that screen. It's showing on here now. Well. Yeah, let's um, just take a second to reset the AV. <laughs> Excellent. Well, please put your body away. Uh, we do not want to see that. No, it's just PowerPoint being dead. That's fun. Huh. PowerPoint, it's good software. In any case, you want to... Can you, can you kill it and... Yeah. I think it's trying to run an update. I have no idea. Hold on. Yeah, there's an update going on on one of your screens. That's what's going on. Excellent. Popped up a modal dialog above PowerPoint as soon as I unplugged the projector. Right, where is PowerPoint now? Okay. All right. Yeah. Hopefully it comes back up on PowerPoint. Did it not come up again? Yeah, we don't have any AV right now. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Oh, a sex master race, right? Hey, there we go. All right. <laughs> I know. Usually we get applause I'm, for working demonstrations, but I we'll was, also yeah. take the projector working. I, would, I hope that's not the only applause we get, um, but it probably is. There we go. Okay, so this is the Chip Whisperer. This is the piece of uh, hardware that Colin O'Flynn developed that, that does that, um, that kind of uh, iterative um, timing, timing thing and then inserting a, a voltage spike or a, a clock glitch and, and then reads out the results. Um, and you kind of tell it how it's, you write some Python code for, uh, to insert into it and you tell it how um, you're going to use how you, how you determine success or failure. You say, okay, if I get 10 bytes back, then that's what I expect. That's a normal run. The glitch did nothing, the fault injection. If I get more than 10 bytes back, like that's definitely uh, incorrect in some way for the, the operation, but it might not be what I want. What I really want is to dump, you know, 30, um, I don't know, 3K of firmware. So if it's like greater than 3K, then that's probably the one I want. And it will draw you, it'll plot you this nice little graph of like the ones that it thinks failed, ones that it thinks worked, and, and so on and so forth. Right, and so one of the, the key things if you're gonna do this in a sane way, if you wanna do this relatively efficiently, is to be able to get the glitch timing exactly right in a reproducible sense. 
So if our glitch timing process is to start from the beginning and move gradually through a program, we need to synchronize ourselves to that program somehow so that every iteration through that program we're always glitching approximately the same place plus or minus our offset. We need to be able to make sure this is a repeatable experiment because if we're not properly synchronized to the program or the clocks for the devices are different, then what will happen is we'll be injecting a glitch at slightly different times per iteration of our experiment. And what that'll mean is that we don't have the ability to know that a given spot responds to a glitch or not because if we glitch after, let's say, 10 microseconds, that could be anywhere in the program. So synchronization is really key. The Chip Whisperer is fantastic at doing the delays itself, but you have to provide synchronization information to it somehow in order for it to do any work whatsoever. Yeah. So if you look at the Chip Whisperer examples, they all start by having the target device manually provide synchronization. That's great if you control the target device, but if you control the target device, you're not going to be looking for its firmware. Yeah, so what you, what you tend to do is you just give, give Chip Whisperer a, a kind of control signal that says, like, when this control signal goes high or low or whatever it is, then that's, the, that's your timing, that's your, your, your trigger. Whereas um, we have, we're dealing with sort of more complex systems than that, and we don't control them. And so the, the general way that people do this is they build some hardware to, to kind of supplement um, the Chip Whisperer on this. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the picture, if you are interested in getting into, into this kind of thing and, and trying out glitching, the section on the right-hand side is a separate breakaway board. It comes attached to the Chip Whisperer, but it, it is a, a dummy target board. And uh, Colin's written some great tutorials and some, some code that you can flash on there and then and get to know the Chip Whisperer software and things like that. I mean, th this is how I learned about glitching. Right. Um, and so, so one way of thinking about this is we're basically fuzzing hardware right now, right? We're taking this and injecting a fault in the same way that you might corrupt data in, to inject faults in software. And in order to be able to do that, we need that full description of what we're actually trying to fuzz, right? You, if you're writing a mutation fuzzer, you take a file format and you start changing it somehow, right? All of that timing information is our equivalent to that kind of fuzzing profile. And the ability to say, okay, I think a USB transaction is going to be vulnerable on this system. Let me go and start doing my glitching while USB transactions are happening really is critical for being able to do this. But when you start attacking a, a complex system, like this, this is actually a pretty average microcontroller, and uh, it's difficult to see on here, but every one of those blocks is a device that in some way is capable of interacting on a system bus, and most of those are capable of doing DMA, and most of them are actually potential uh, vectors that you could use to glitch information out of a system. But if your process is that you create a custom piece of hardware to work with every one of those things and trigger off of every one of those things, then the process of figuring out how to get firmware out of a device is one where you keep building a piece of uh, triggering hardware to test the system and then figuring out whether that piece of hardware works or not. So you spend many hours building something that's going to trigger. And then eventually you might say, OK, I think this piece of code is not as vulnerable as I thought. Let me go and try the next one. And it can become really, really, really exhaustive uh, and exhausting trying to do this search where you're building triggering hardware in order to actually start exploring each one of those uh, peripherals and each one of those potential attack vectors. Next slide? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so what we decided to build, um, let's be honest, what Kate decided to build and uh, took me along for the ride um, was uh, glitch kit. And the idea is to be able to talk to those target systems using all those different communication methods that they might use, um, have fairly tightly controlled timing, allow complex triggers that are based off um, much more complex state of the machine. And, and basically the idea is to get the target device into a given state and know when it's in that state so that we can give a very precise timing trigger to the chip whisperer. We're not replacing the chip whisperer, we're augmenting it. Um, and the idea that previously, as, as Kate just said, a lot of people would build multiple versions of attack hardware that augment the chip whisperer. What we're trying to do is take one generic platform, which is, um, happens, to be, happens to be great fit, um, because we already had great fits uh, lying around and I work on it. Um, and use that to to kind of build this like multiple uh, attack platform, um, featuring uh, having a bunch of features, which we'll go into in more depth in a second. Um, right. The whole reason that GreatFit exists in the first place is just because the microcontroller that's on there, the LPC forty three thirty, has so many useful peripherals that when Mike Osman was kind of looking at it and using it on HackRF, 
he kind of had the thought, well, we really need to make all these peripherals available to people for easy use, especially like wrapped in a nice Python API. And so the microcontroller on uh, GreatFet was actually chosen to talk as many things as we could for as cheap a possible price as we could and, you know, and so to get that balance right. And so it kind of makes a, a perfect choice to use as a foundation for something like GlitchKit because it does talk to so many different things and can be a basis for triggering attacks using so many different protocols. Yeah, it has so many different peripherals and, and just being able to access those peripherals and use them means we can attack more and more systems. Um, so let's go through the different sections of, of GlitchKit. We have the synchronization. Um, we can manage the clocks between the target and the chip whisperer and the great fetch so that they're all clock synchronized with each other so our timing is incredibly precise. Um, and then we've got this event router which makes which kind of ties everything together and allows us to um, kind of say there's a you know this complex set of states over here and these USB transactions happen and then if this GPIO line which could be just like a status LED on the thing if that blinks three times, then um, we know that's the point at which we, we set off our, our chip whisperer to, to trigger. Right. So the, the glitching process often looks like a multi-stage kind of event sequencing process where you'll start off saying, okay, first I want to turn on power to the device. Then I want to spin up its clock, right? We don't want to provide a clock before the power is there. Then sometime later when I see that the device has booted up, I want to start sending it packets over USB. And the event routing system ties all the pieces of GlitchKit together so that we can do things like have event-driven stepping through that kind of, you could almost think of it like a glitching finite state machine. Right. Um, sorry. And then often we want to actually induce a state in a given device. For example, uh, if we're glitching a USB peripheral, we, we might think it's vulnerable to certain USB vendor requests. We might ask that USB device to describe itself and then want to do fault injection as it's describing itself in order to potentially adjust the length of that description. So being able to induce behaviors in devices is important to this as well. Yeah, USB is a really good example here. Um, for like the, the descriptor, the way a USB device enumerates is is very standard, and it sends some descriptors, and then a bit later, the, the host will request things like um, strings to, to know who your manufacturer or your, um, or your product name is and things like that. And it might be that those are stored in memory somewhere and they're DMA'd out, and if we can inject a fault when they're being requested, then that's the, uh, that's the point at which it might be vulnerable, and they might be stored close to the bottom of memory so we can grab them or, or, or whatever. And they will be good targets for, for glitching, but we have to get it through the other steps of enumeration before it's going to give us those strings. We can't just plug the thing in and power it up, apply power, and it suddenly and just request those strings. We have to do all the other things that it expects beforehand and get it into this more complex state um, or this deeper state. Or it might be that there's something, some function that you know, once you've written, once you've filled up the cache on a USB disk or something, then it's gets into a state where we might be able to glitch something out of it, but we have to do all the transactions that get us to that stage before then. Um, and so that's why being able to manipulate it as a USB device or, or a USB host is, is, um, is really helpful to us in this. Uh, and then obviously we're, a bit, we're able to um, trigger the event based on various output from the device. Um, and this, you know, USB kind of exists in this category as well, but um, for example, we can, if it's got a UART on it and we hook up to the UART pins and we can look at data that's coming out of there and we say, well, we know when the bootloader dumps its version string that we have to wait X amount of time before we can uh, glitch it and have it like dump out some other piece, like the firmware over the UART or, or via some other method. Um, or the simple event triggers is, it's actually, I mean, you call it simple, but it's actually like, it allows you to build these like kind of arbitrarily complex like state machines of these pins go high at this time and do it this many times and then this pin goes high and you can look at kind of um, communication buses that are on the board and you can look at how many times the device has read from its flash chip before it uh, as, an, as it boots up and you can say, okay, we want to glitch after it's finished reading this many bytes from flash and we can work that out with the simple event triggers as well. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about the switch and the Wii U kind of stuff that's being done. So Yeah, I want to give you time to get onto that. Yep. So. And so this is just a really high level view of how everything connects together. If you're using GlitchKit, you're using the GreatFet one. Optionally, a board that sits on top of it that makes glitching easier, called Indigo. Completely not necessary, um, but it helps. The Chip Whisperer Lite is what we use for the process of taking a trigger and converting it into an actual uh, glitch signal. 
And then you have your target device sometimes, which you will modify. Uh, and we'll show you some examples of target devices in just a second. Uh, this is actually just uh, a couple of schematics showing the Indigo neighbor, which on this page mostly does connections. If you go to the next one, this is hardware that's designed actually to give you a really nice glitch pulse. So one of the things that it's hard to see, but yeah. but it's, uh, it's also kind of hard the to The slides will be online afterwards mm -hmm. if anyone's interested in looking at this. And obviously this but is already, you developed this on stream the other day, so it's, it, yep, like, so it's, it's already on, shown on publicly already. somewhere. The, the important part here is just this is hardware that makes it really easy to start doing some of those voltage glitches by giving you all the base platform you need in order to be able to start pulling rails around, start pulling voltages up and down on these kind of boards. It's meant to make it, you have to do a lot less development in order to start actually engaging in uh, glitching real devices. So uh, we're going to talk about some of the people who are actually using GlitchKit now and some of the stuff that's being done with it. One of my favorite uh, examples of the use of this kind of technique is actually done in a friend of mine named Hedgeberg Streams. And she actually has been using these to attack both the Nintendo Switch and the Wii U. The Wii U actually wound up being targeted because it's easier to talk about that publicly. I and Hedgeberg both belong to a Nintendo Switch hacking team, and we've done a lot of cool stuff, most of it private. In the past week, we actually got from the browser to Trust Zone on most of the Nintendo Switch versions, so that was fun. But this actually was, uh, the glitching technique was applied to the Switch initially in order to be able to uh, a kind of an attempt to be able to steal some keys from the Switch's very early bootloader. And the Switch starts up, reads firmware off of its eMMC, and then verifies that firmware using RSA cryptography, and then decrypts it using AES. And one of the neat things you can do as that firmware is loaded is start injecting faults in the bootstrap processor that loads that firmware to start with. And if you can do that, basically the way the firmware works is it checks whether the RSA signature matches, stores the result in a register. Because it was written in C, the two possible register values that are of consequence are zero and anything else. So usually what winds up happening is we put some other firmware there, some custom firmware on the eMMC. The RSA check happens. It says, OK, this is not at all related to what we wanted, zero. If you can inject a glitch as it's writing into that register or reading from that register, then you can sometimes change that zero to literally anything else. And instead of executing the a bootloader that has been signed and validating that the bootloader is signed, it takes our payload and just jams it right into the switch's memory. And that's really nice, because if you're the first thing that runs, you still have access to all the decryption keys that are used for the rest of the system. So um, don't want to talk too much about that, because we don't want things patched. But we're, the, we're also low on time. Yep. So let's quickly go to uh, Micah's work. Um, this uh, Micah also known as Scanline. This is a, a thing that she did uh, what, about just over a year ago, 18 months ago. Um, it involves a tablet that you might use to, um, with, with one of the stylus to, as an input device. And she wanted to see if she could use it to read RFID tokens. And um, one of the aspects of this was to dump out the firmware, because it was completely black box. Had no idea how it worked, but was pretty sure she could do this. And um, she used USB, uh, this, that USB descriptor type glitching, that, um, and that's where we learn the technique from. Um, and so the way that tends to be implemented inside is um, you pass back various chunks of data in small USB transactions, and every time you calculate the pointer to the next part, and then you do another, you know, uh, however many your max packet size of bytes is. Right, so this structure is specified by the actual USB spec. This is a standard way of storing data that's to be transmitted in USB, and the important part, the highlighted part there, includes the amount of bytes that are going to be transferred using this DMA descriptor. So if you go to the next slide, we can kind of show you how a USB yeah. transaction works. So this is how it normally works. It, it takes um, 64 bytes. It increments the pointer to the next bit of data. Next transaction, 64, or next packet, 64 bytes increments the, the pointer. But if we inject a fault at exactly the right time, we can uh, change that. Well, so you can see the length value at the top of the screen. Uh, and then if we just uh, inject a fault, we can end up with an arbitrarily large length value in there, and so it will just keep transferring us more and more and more bytes, and it will never terminate the transaction, because USB terminates the transaction by sending either a zero-length packet or a short packet at the end. So rather than, like, the host, the host does not know how many bytes it's expecting. Um, and so if you set up the host so that it will happily take those bytes and, and dump them out to file or, or memory somewhere, then you can just keep arbitrarily reading more things as long as you can inject the fault at the point 
at which it's calculating that length. Um, and this is actually a screenshot from the Chip Whisperer software. And um, again, it's not super readable on the projector, but what you'll notice is there's some various different like red and green lines. Uh, they do have text in them on my version of the slide. Um, and uh, essentially, that's like looking at the output. And that, this is how Chip Whisperer tells you. You, you say, um, this is what the output should look like. And so those are the white lines. They're the ones that it doesn't care about. OK, the system didn't fail in any way. The red lines are, we got, a, we got a glitch, we got a fault injection, but we didn't get the output we hoped for. And the green ones are, we got a lot of output. Like This is what we were hoping for. This meets the criteria for what you're searching for. And so you can then go into the interface, click on them, and just pull out everything that it got back, everything that it received. And um, you can go and look at those. And sometimes that will be the entire firmware of your device, if you're, if you're lucky. And so when Micah actually built this, she, having, not having anything like glitch could existing, went and built a custom piece of hardware called uh, uh, Face Whisper. Face, yeah. And Face Whisper actually was an entire PCB with a microcontroller on it with a USB host stack that was meant to take the, uh, to take this whole USB transaction and step through it. That took a lot of time and a lot of effort. The glitch kit code to do the same thing looks like this. So really, it's actually a simple uh, set of Python commands that are actually wrapped in a GUI most of the time. The first block ensures that the device, the target device, and the, all the glitching setup are synchronized to the same clock. The next says don't do any glitching or any stimuli injection until the device has booted up. And the final uh, lines say what we want you to do is actually send a USB request, ask for some information, and then when that happens, send a trigger over to the chip whisperer in order to inject glitches. So that is the entire uh, thing simplified down to a few lines of Python for what would have been otherwise a multi-week process. So what we needed to do when we uh, when we written this code was find a target device to test it on. And as I said previously, we, we had some great fets around. Uh, so we had to, uh, Kate had to modify it. Um, so this board was actually modified like the evening of Christmas. It was right before CCC and we wanted more cool demos for it. And like the board already looked pretty bad. It wasn't you know, they're quite this bad, but the only thing I did to it is pull all the capacitors off, and maybe two or three beers later, it was probably not a great time to be pulling them off, so it got a little messy, but, and we're sorry for that, but yeah. so especially to the people on Twitter who immediately responded to seeing this photo with clean your board, damn it. Um, so one of the reasons you take the capacitors off is the capacitors are there to try and stabilize the power supply, and we're going to try and do unstable things to the power supply, so we take the, the capacitors off, um, and then this, um, Bottom right-hand side, there's a, just a big capacitor to kind of uh, make sure this thing, thing still works. But the, um, do you want to explain it? Like the way it discharges so, means that we can inject faults so more easily. All the capacitors are previously connected directly to the VCC rail, and we're trying to keep that VCC rail up. What I've done there is take all those capacitors off, put a resistor in series, and then put them on the other side of the resistor so that while they were um, providing enough power to keep the device working in a normal state, that impedance kind of prevents them from recharging the device quickly. And so we can actually still inject faults without having to pull all those capacitors down to zero. Yeah, so we, we decided that it would be fun to try and glitch the firmware out of this thing. But um, naturally, we expected to get one of these from Mike Osman. Uh, wow, that's not super breedable either. Uh, this is a cease and desist letter for the last time Travis Goodspeed attempted to uh, uh, dump firmware from one of our devices using a, a hacking technique. Uh, and we expected to get one of these. Uh, so what we decided to do was, was glitch the ROM code that's already in the um, LPC 4300, not our own code. Um, what happens is the code gets uh, copied from flash into memory, uh, fairly near the, the bottom of memory. And so if we can um, glitch the, the ROM code that's in there, we can hopefully read out, just keep going and keep reading out the so, rest of memory. So the LPC 4330S actually accepts its firmware in a variety of formats. One of those formats is over USB. Others are via serial chips. And that takes in encrypted firmware, firmware that we don't necessarily know the actual plain text value of, and converts it to plain text firmware in memory. If we can start fault injecting as it's responding to a firmware request saying, OK, yes, I received the firmware. Here's a checksum, or here's an indication that the status of that upload was OK, then what we actually get is the, rest, the contents of memory immediately following the ROM bootloader, which happened to include, if you can see it on the flowchart, the plain text version of the 
firmware that was just immediately copied to uh, the very start of RAM. Yeah, so we let the chip de decrypt it for us, and then we just pull it straight out of RAM. Uh, we, oh, we have plans to expand. Do you want to show that? Or, because we only have yeah, show, five minutes. Show, show the firmware. All right, again, I'm going to let you work the Mac. Mm -hmm. Assuming this thing uh, likes us. So this is actually the firmware for the LPC 4330 uh, bootloader. This is the contents of the bootloader itself, uh, including the USB descriptors, which are, were, are normally sent out when the device first starts talking over USB, and then everything that follows it in memory. And this is interesting, uh, because it actually gave us a pretty good idea of how the LPC 4330 bootloader works. But it's not what we're after, because we could have dumped this with something like GDB. We could have done it. I was just going to go to the USB. Yeah, go ahead. What's much more important is that no. following this in memory is everything else that that microcontroller knows at the time, which potentially include encryption secrets, the actual AS uh, keys that were loaded into memory in order to do the decryption, and which almost definitely include the firmware that was just decrypted. Yeah, so the, the other thing it contains is, um, is we, were, we were looking at this, and we were looking through it and to, to just check it. How it, how it looked. And we, I saw this USB thing, and I said, oh, it's USB. It says USB-S. And Kate said, that's weird. That's a, a USB mass storage thing. Like USB-S and USB-C are a command and status for um, the USB storage SCSI protocol. And we had to go back to the data sheet. And lo and behold, it turns out this thing has USB mass storage capabilities in its ROM, which we'd never bothered looking at and didn't even know were there until we dumped the firmware out of the thing. So it's kind of enlightening that you can definitely see, uh, which I've highlighted. And again, you'd have to be probably quite close to the screen to see it. But I've highlighted that you know, we've got this other USB code in there, but we'd also get our own code dumped out of the thing as well, um, and whatever else you've flashed into that thing. And this was, again, just a, a simple kind of insert a glitch during the USB enumeration stage, and we were able to use a second great fit to trigger that enumeration stage. I'm going to try and know. How can I? Yeah? Yeah, to yeah. the direction. All right. Are we good? Yep, we're good. Let's go. Hit current slide. Let's skip the future plans one. And, uh, well, let's do future plans very quickly. Okay. So future plans are to make it m do more things. Um, make it so that we have more things we can monitor, more things we can trigger on, more things we can control. All these are controllable from Great Fet, um, so we can deal with uh, various other communication protocols, deal with um, like Ethernet and Spy and talking to EMMC devices and so on and so forth to make this just a very generic tool for um, like targeting any piece of embedded uh, hardware that you're interested in. And with that, we're about out of time. Uh, we can take maybe one question. No, yes, no. A very short question, or we'll just take them outside if anyone has them uh, out there. Hmm? Thank you.